one panelist, but Jennifer will arrive in a, in a short while. Um, but good afternoon and welcome to the panel discussion. What is happening in South America and why? My name is Anna Heikinen. I am a PhD candidate in development studies at the University of Helsinki, researching water governance and climate vulnerabilities in Peru. Uh, South America has been boiling the past fall or the spring from the perspective of the continent. From Ecuador to Chile, um, have experienced uh, political crises and uh, widespread protests that in some cases have escalated into violent clashes between the protesters and the government actors. There have been debates in the newspapers all, ar all around the world whether Latin American Spring has arrived to the continent. In today's panel, we aim to discuss the underlying causes uh, behind the political crisis and the protests, and uh, also who have been the people who have been involved in the protest and what have been the grievances that have driven them to take the streets. Uh, with our panelists with the backgrounds in academia, uh, journalism and acti activism, we aim to especially discuss the diversity of, of causes that, uh, that have led to the protest in different countries in uh, South America. And the event is organized by Development Studies and the Academy of Finland funded research project Citizen Utopias in Glo Global South. Uh, we also have a hashtag for the event, uh, which is South American Protest. You can also see it there reflected on the screen. So in case you wish to discuss on, on Twitter or elsewhere in social media, please use the, the hashtag South American Protest. Uh, we will begin the panel discussion with our panelists having experience working in, in different South American countries. And after the common discussion, a uh, professor of Latin American studies from the University of Helsinki, Jussi Pakkasvirta, uh, will comment the discussion. And at the uh, end of the event, we will have some time for the, for the comments uh, and questions of, of the public. And we, of course, wish for your active participation in order to have a vivid exchange of, of thoughts on, on South American situation. But uh, now I would like to welcome our, our panelists. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for coming here today and um, uh, to discuss and, and share your views. On, on the situation in, in South America. So, I would first like to introduce our panelists. So, we have here Dr. Auri Leskinen, who currently works as a development director um, in, of education export to Latin America in Edupark, Finland. And Auli has also worked as a, as a journalist for ULE in Chile between 1992 and 2007, and also conducted a doctoral research on Chile's democracy development from cultural perspective. Uh, then we have ye here uh, Jennifer Garrido, who is a Chilean occupational therapist, uh, currently living in, in Finland. And here in Helsinki, Jennifer is a member uh, in the group Solidarity with Chile from Finland. And in Chile, Jennifer uh, has also participated actively in the community groups promoting ecological and buen vivir practices. We also have here Dr. Paula Minoya, who is a senior lecturer in development studies at the University of Helsinki. And Paula is also a leader of uh, the Academy Finland project on eco-cultural pluralism in the Ecuadorian Amazonia. Uh, then we have uh, Herman Gimbayo Ruiz, and Herman is a PhD. 
candidate and researcher in environmental policy at the University of Eastern Finland. And Herman's doctoral research is about contemporary environmental conflicts related to urban planning and nature in Bogota, Colombia. And then we have uh, Laura Kumpuniemi, who is an activist and PhD candidate, also from the University of Eastern Finland. Um, and Laura's doctoral research focuses on alternative economic activities and their political dimensions and connections to democratization in Cochabamba, Bolivia. Uh, in her research and activism, Laura is also interested in social movement's role for democracy alternatives to mainstream development model and human rights issues. So, welcome everyone. Thank you so much. To begin with, uh, I would like you um, or to, to ask you to tell a little bit more about your work and activities. In, in South America, and also to give a short description in a nutshell, um, what have been the, the, the causes behind the protest, and what is the current situation in the, in the country where you have been focusing on? So if you would like to start, start Auli, okay, please. So much. Um, good morning to everyone. Is this working? Yes, this is working. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It was very kind. And I'm very happy to see so many people in, in, interested in this, this topic, which I found, uh, I found so interesting at the and important at the moment. Well, I, uh, I have been uh, these, personally, I have been in these uh, past couple of years several times in Latin America. Uh, this year, uh, that was uh, uh, the past year, I uh, visited uh, during four months Latin America. I stayed uh, mainly in Chile and Peru and also in Mexico this past year. And then uh, before that uh, I have been working as I work now as a director, development director of education, export and education, education internationalis internationalization for several universities in Finland. So I mainly, uh, my work focuses on those uh, academic issues. And that's why I meet uh, people from different sectors, from ministries, from universities, rectors of universities. Um, I uh, meet uh, students, I meet uh, company representatives, both private and public sectors. And I think it has been very interesting now to listen what they and these different sectors think about their prices at the moment. Before this time, I have been working as a researcher, mainly Latin American literature and art researcher in Chile. And um, uh, I have lived there, well, I don't know, I have not found it so, so exactly, but maybe about 15 years uh, in Argentina and uh, Chile mainly. So uh, this is my background. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, I'm Jennifer Garrido. As I live here in Finland about one year. I born and grew up in Chile. Uh, well, I work in mental health, public health in Chile as part of my discipline, occupational therapy. I lived in Argentina for one year before that in between studies. And I developed uh, several projects around uh, realization, um, inclusion, always using ecological practices, permaculture, agroecology, in central and south area of Chile. I decided to start traveling and finally ended up here in Finland. And well, here in Finland, since this start, the political crisis and uh, the uprising in Chile, we've been, uh, I've been taking part of some activities that have been uh, organized by a group of Chileans resident, uh, residents here in Finland. We've been doing things from the first week of October until well, a month ago, and maybe we come back again to do some similar activities. 
Uh, well, also I would like to thank you all to be here and, and be interested on, on taking maybe more information, maybe to express also your point of view about all these happenings in Latin America, about all this crisis that has been holding for so long and now it's just like the explosion and the manifestation of, of the lifestyle of the political style of doing things that sometimes is it's not too easy to see from abroad and even being in Chile it's not easy to see all the scenarios I think working in the fields I work for I could have like a like a perspective that many of even my families and my friends didn't take part of so I can just like point out that Chile at this moment is a very divided country from from the way we realize and we see the things that happen. I think we're going to uh, talk about that more. And well, yeah, thank you so much. And we can, can have like a fruitful discussion today. Okay, thank you very much, Anna, for organizing this uh, this gathering. I mean, it's actually very important because of, and, um, we have our own uh, perspective on different countries, so to build commonalities and see what uh, continuities there are across the countries, this is, this is great. So I am Paola Minoia, I'm a senior lecturer here, and I, as Anna was saying, I'm also uh, coordinating a project funded by the Academy of Finland uh, that we have uh, together with, uh, uh, with some partners in, uh, it's a collaborative project uh, with uh, uh, the Universidad Amazonica uh, del Ecuador, um, uh, Estatal, uh, and, uh, and also we collaborate with uh, uh, several representatives of uh, uh, indigenous organizations as well. And uh, this, this project is about uh, uh, ecological and cultural knowledges in, uh, um, um, and their diversity in Ecuador. Uh, so, uh, to promote uh, the need to go beyond uh, the, I mean, the Western perspective in education and to have the knowledge and the cosmology uh, and the history uh, of, the, of the country in the multiple uh, way of po uh, possible way. And this is a, what to say, this is a process that started, I mean, this uh, intercultural education uh, is something that has been starting in the late 80s in uh, in Ecuador, but it has ha had uh, ups and downs, and I would say that uh, it's a very it's not only cultural but it's political matter, uh, especially for a country that is claimed to be plurinational. The recognition of different uh, ontologies and different uh, uh, epistemic uh, rights is fundamental. So uh, this is something that exists, uh, is uh, stated in the Constitution of 2008, which is very famous, the Constitution that uh, uh, everyone knows, I mean, it's inspiring also, the, I mean, many other countries uh, in, uh, in relation to the recognition of uh, uh, the rights uh, of nature, but uh, there is uh, a lot which is still, uh, <laughs> which is still words and not uh, applied. So my perspective, of course, is from the side of the indigenous people, I mean, of the Amazonian region, at least, and the people working and living there, and uh, uh, but which are essential in this also political situation in Ecuador, because uh, uh, what has happened in Ecuador was not, uh, how to say, an urban, um, so rising and uh, so, but it's uh, something that uh, has involved uh, deeply the indigenous organization. So uh, they have, a, I would say, Conaye, which is the umbrella organization of the indigenous uh, people, is a, has a, a really is a powerful political force. So Ecuador is a country that has. Uh, a diversity, political diversity, which is mainly based on ethnic diversity, and uh, um, these uh, uh, so these uh, dialectical relation between uh, uh, the, the, the Western colonial uh, inherited state and uh, and uh, and the rest, which is the majority of the people, is uh, 
is very visible on the on the dialectics between the government and Konaya. So uh, and yeah, I I would stop here at the moment, but then yeah, we'll continue. Thank you. Oops. Okay. <laughs> uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone, and first and foremost, thank you, Anna, and the rest of the people in Helsinki University for uh, organize this. Uh, it's very important, very relevant. Uh, I'm not going to read on on the acknowledgments that they were already made. Well, my experience in, in this event, I'm not going to talk uh, in depth on my research work in Bogota, that is on the environmental conflict related with urban planning. That uh, this project is coming from my previous experience as a practitioner there in Bogota and also an activist in environmental uh, issues. But I would like to. Uh, take the chance of this opportunity because also the political context in, in Colombia is, is kind of like a unique. Uh, I'm just talking about from my own experience. I'm not talking here on behalf of any parties and politics or any institutions, just for myself. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't been present uh, on the streets recently. Uh, although I would like to be there uh, because this has been very important for Colombia because in Colombia it's not common that. Uh, most of the people went to the streets. I mean, unlike other countries in South America and in, in Latin America, uh, the political context in Colombia, I mean, historically, uh, the social protests and, and, and demonstrations have been demonized, stigmatized. And besides that, uh, I mean, I also want to make a remark uh, that is important to take in, into account to, during this event that there is no such a, such a thing of a, of a unique Latin American experience, I mean, or South American experience. Uh, it's important to highlight that each country, even though shares similar historical paths coming from colonial times or even post-colonial processes, is so different one to another. And especially in Colombia, Colombia has been probably uh, the country with the longest political and armed conflict in the Western Hemisphere. So that changed completely the game, the, the game in, in, in Colombian politics. Uh, democracy has been uh, a, a very fragile state for a long time. I mean, this is not a new thing. The new thing is that now people is going to the streets. That's a new thing, and, and going peacefully. But I mean, dictatorship like rep state repression, uh, political persecution, political violence, uh, they are not a new thing in Colombia. I mean, we have been going through this for a while. Uh, of course, drug violence has been also uh, a, a very sad history in our uh, country. At least Colombia has, like, a, in, in the past of the 30 years, almost seven Colombians have been by red forced displaced uh, from the countryside to the cities. Seven million people have. I mean, we have one of the worst uh, figures in four in terms of forced displacements in, in the world, actually. Uh, and also, we have like uh, between eight thousand or 120,000 uh, abducted uh, and disappeared people, that this figure is like a doubling in soon the two dictatorships in, in the South Cone and Chile and Argentina. I mean, in Colombia, there are more disappeared and, disa uh, and abducted people in democracy. So, and now we are realized that, I mean, and this was thankfully because after the peace agreement 2016 between the Colombian state and the uh, former FARC guerrilla. Uh, so now the country starts to open the eyes that the problem wasn't the internal enemy. So now, uh, especially the new generations are against all these uh, uh, unfortunately violent uh, acts on and, and political and historically uh, war state because it's a war, it's an internal war. So, and of course, with environmental matters and urban uh, context, it has relation because. But this is how the inequality is expressed in urban environments, how these violence effects have been expressed in, in how people access urban spaces, green spaces, and it creates a, a more just city. So I'm going to stop on that, uh, try to make this neutral, and give the, the word to Laura. So. Uh, good afternoon. So my name is Laura Gumpuremi, as, as was said earlier, and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Eastern Finland in um, social policy. And my research is focused on uh, solidarity economy and uh, grassroots alternative economies, especially focusing on 
small-scale ag agroecological initiatives in, in Cochabamba, and uh, I'm looking into their political dimensions and their relation to uh, democratization processes in, in Bolivia. Uh, in the past three, three and a half years, I've spent uh, around eight, nine months in total in, in Bolivia, mostly in the Cochabamba area, um, doing, doing field work with, with people uh, working in alternative economies there. Uh, so I haven't, I mean, nine months is something, but I'm not uh, an expert on, on uh, what's happening in the whole country, but uh, I'm, I'm following the situation, so that's, uh, that's my background for trying to give you a, a review of what's been happening in, in Bolivia now. I'm also a human rights activist by my background. I've been doing solidarity work um, with, for example, with Brazilian uh, alternative economy activists and uh, in Bolivia I've also participated in some some uh, activities of, of uh, for example against gender violence um, yeah and uh, I would also like to emphasize that in, in the Bolivian case there's a very black and white media presentation uh, of, of the situation in many cases so it's quite difficult to get the sense of what's happening in reality. Um, so I've been trying to talk with the people I know in Bolivia during these past few few months, reading different kind of uh, sources from, from the media and try to get um, kind of a more plural view of, of what's been happening. <coughs> but it's not easy, I, I must say. Um, but yeah, so basically, um, it's difficult to describe in, in a nutshell what's been happening. But uh, basically, uh, what's um, what's happened in the past few months is that uh, there was an election, a general election in Bolivia in in the end of October, uh, which then caused mass mass political um, protests. Uh, the Main main candidates in the elections was Eva, Evo Morales, uh, who's been in, in power in Bolivia for almost 14 years, um, and he was the first indigenous president in in uh, Bolivia. And he's rise to power in 2005, brought kind of this political window of opportunity for many people, many indigenous uh, peoples. Uh, many many leftist people had hopes and dreams of, of a totally changed country after a lot of um, kind of um, focus focus of, of power in, in the late el elites before before that. Um, Morales brought as as in Ecuador. Um, Morales also brought, brought into attention uh, rights of the Mother Earth. He was talking about Vivian Bien. He had a very uh, anti-neoliberal and anti-capitalist uh, agenda. Uh, they wrote a new constitution um, and that created a lot of hopes for, for the people in Bolivia. Uh, his term was characterized by quite a good uh, stable situation after, after um, many years of instability. He was able to uh, reduce poverty a lot. Social inclusion was in the rise. Um, he gave a lot of opportunities to indigenous peoples, but at the same time, his term also um, gave more space to extract extractive activities. And he, in the recent years, he's been concentrating Power. Uh, there have been ten anti-democratic tendencies in his government, and um, the ideas of VVV that he brought brought to the policy politics uh, were kind of put into practice in a techno technocratic manner. Manner. So there were there was a lot of disappointment in the in, the, in his government. So this uh, election in October uh, was kind of a 
turning point between his his government and uh, something that could be an option for for, for his government. He had uh, abolished term limits basically through um, first losing a referendum in 2016 uh, about abolishing the term limits for presidency. Um, after after which he um, brought his um, his bid to the constitutional court that allowed him to run again, um, even though he had already been there for for the constitutional uh, limitation time. So in the elections, he was against uh, well many other other opponents, but. His main opponent was Carlos Mesa, and uh, there, in the elections there was a lot of there were a lot of allegations and assumptions of fraud. Uh, there were signs of irregularities. A lot of social media posts were suggesting um, that um, a lot of fraud was happening, and that brought the people to the streets first and foremost. Uh, but after uh, after the official count was was finished, Morales was claimed winner, and this caused a lot of unrest and demonstrations that I will then talk about later. Thank you so much, everyone, for for your comments and, and thoughts on the situation. Um, it comes quite clear when I was listening to what you were talking that that uh, as Herman also said that the situation and the causes in, in each country are, are different um, and so to say the, the story be behind the political crisis and also the, the grievances of, of people vary between each country as Paula mentioned that in Ecuador, um, the indigenous people are, are strongly involved in, in the protest. And in Chile, for instance, the deep inequalities and the divisions with people. Um, so I would like to ask, uh, what kind of groups of, of people in each country initiated the, the protest and, and later have been involved in, in them? And uh, what have been the main causes that that took them to the streets, and what kind of demands they they have to their leaders? Um, we can start with Aili and, and take the full round again, please, Aili. Aili. So I would like to say that I, I described uh, this movement uh, uh, and protest movement in, in Chile with the words of my young friend Manuel Munoz. Uh, whom I have been, I have known for a long time in Chile. Uh, he has described this movement like a, it is like a wild horse, which is wild horse which is galloping in the streets all over the country, and all the political forces and parties want to straddle it, but they have not been able, and they surely will not be able. And what uh, did my friend mean with this? Um, it means that uh, it means that I see it in this way that the people that started these protests, protests are people uh, mainly outside from the political parties. They are very young people, 13, 14, 15, 16 year, year, years old young people from low income families, from middle income families and very conscious upper income families. Retired elderly persons who can, cannot uh, live anymore and they can't subsist anymore with their poor and really shameful pensions about 150 euros a month. And uh, indigenous people, of course, which have been, and their movement have been marginalized in the southern part of uh, Chile, but now there has been a change because uh, when I have been traveling and living during the past 30 years in Chile, uh, uh, I would say that only some uh, conscious sectors have been talking about indigenous people there. But now you can take a, cab, a, cab, a taxi 
in, in Santiago, you can meet common people in the streets, and now they talk about Mapuche people, and they uh, talk about the indigenous rights. So the indigenous um, uh, people's uh, symbols, like uh, Mapuche people's flag, uh, has um, has become a symbol of all this fight movement, which is very inspiring and interesting. Uh, I would say also that, all, of course, intellectuals, of course, the left-wing activists and parties are there. I would say that all the people who cannot uh, stand anymore the incredible injustice uh, that uh, this uh, neoliberal economical model has produced uh, to, to Chile in the last 30 years of democracy and before that uh, during the uh, Augusto, General Augusto Pinochet's uh, military regime. So all these injustices and all these structure, structural uh, imbal imbalances that were great, created consciously during the Augusto Pinochet's, Pinochet's regime, they continue being valid in Chile. Now, Chile it was the first OECD country in Latin America. It has been named as the ideal little rich country in the southern part, in the southern cone of Latin America. But actually, the gap between the richest and the poorest persons has uh, grown uh, to this extent that now it's the most deep to, in the whole continent. It's very uh, hard to be young people young person in Chile if you don't have money to study. I can totally understand that if I would uh, see that my uh, parents, my uh, grandparents die because they have not, uh, they can not allow the operations in hospitals for the lack of the social and uh, health services and the high prices which were, um, the private uh, services were uh, defined and established as a rule in the Chilean constitution in 1980. If these young people can see that they can never even imagine to study practically anything in any upper education institution, so what can they do? They, have, they don't have nothing to lose. They can uh, throw stones. I would do it also if I would be in their position. Well, that's my country of, of politics, Chile as well. <laughs> okay. uh, well, maybe just uh, get a little bit deeper into like the, the level of inequality in Chile uh, is something that is, is easy to see if you just go visit, if you go to stay there a little bit longer. If you live there, it's something that it seems to be impossible to solve. Like people has this um, kind of um, feeling of that things are as they are, and and it, that this is the way we should live. Uh, this start in October with the rising of prices of metro, but of course it, it, it is a slogan that is not 30, 30, 30 pesos. It's, it's more than 30 years of of a quality of life that goes every time lower and lower for the majority of people as the index of economical growth in Chile goes bigger and bigger and from abroad it seems like, okay, this is a good place to be. Uh, maybe it's an interesting point to, to know that uh, transportation is the second um, expenses that families have after food. It takes m more than 20% of the minimum wage. So of course, like a rising of prices that don't, don't even affect the students in particular, was the the last drop to create this big chaos that start escalating even uh, more and more during October, and and create this, this massive uh, uh, start of, of manifestations on the streets. Uh, Chile has a I don't know if it's to say a uh, culture, but we are used to, to see. Um, more and more these last years, uh, protests and manifestations on the street in, in different topics, as, as I will just say, uh, because there is so many things to, to, to complain about as you are living there and you have to accept everything. The pensions, the price, the cost of living, the cost of education, the quality and the cost of health, 
So the system is created to, if you can pay, you can access. So there is already at this moment the generation of the like the son of the people that have been living in in very low quality quality of life. They they feel like they don't have anything to lose. And that is something that, as, as you say, they don't feel represented by any for particular uh, side of, of political party. So they are just giving everything in the street. At this moment, there is uh, uh, organized first line of people are, um, fighting against police every Friday and for many days so far. But they are well organized uh, at this moment. They belong to well, different different social classes. But it's unfortunate to see that there is many of these people giving the fight on the streets now recently and, and, and for long. That belongs to the kids that are assisted in the public service for orphans and well. It's, it's, a, it's a case that, that of, the, of course, affected the students, that they see that they will not have opportunities, affected the elder people, affected the community workers, and the support in this, in this protest that has happening is very transversal. It's very, uh, like, don't have much, much color, political color, but, but yeah, it's something that is support for, I can say, for like a big part of of different scenarios. Thank you, Jennifer. <coughs> Paola. Yeah. Okay, I would like to shift a bit the, the, the focus on the political, economic, the, the financial also situation in Ecuador. Uh, that is the, the cause of this uh, paquetazo, which is the FMI uh, package of economic reforms that were proposed on 3rd October, and that uh, caused the, the immediate reaction of people going to the streets. So uh, the rules have to be, of course, uh, considered uh, from the Korea time. So Korea was the president between uh, 2007 and 2017, uh, followed by the current one, who is Lenny Moreno, who, uh, who used to be the vice president in his uh, government, in Korea's government, but then uh, changed completely the politics. So he was said to be betraying the uh, Revolution Ciudadana, so the, the citizenship revolution of Korea. During Korea time, there was, a, a, I mean, from, especially during 2010, 2011, there was a peak of, uh, uh, how to say, um, econ of, of financial resources coming from uh, uh, an economy that was uh, especially extractivist. So, um, but uh, it was, uh, how to say, uh, in a good moment, because at that time the <clears throat> the oil was uh, at its peak. Its peak. It was uh, something like uh, 110 dollars per barrel. Why in uh, four years uh, it dropped dramatically to 30 dollars. So, which means that all the um, uh, uh, all the planning that was done uh, based on those uh, availabilities of funding collapsed and. Uh, and uh, I mean, he, he really did a lot of things. I mean, uh, it was also, like in Colombia, a special uh, period of, uh, of um, how to say, there were social turbulences, but at least uh, politically there was some stability because uh, the, the previous years there have been uh, you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of governments uh, just lasting very, very short time. And during that time uh, of Korea, he really undertook uh, um, a big reform. Uh, and so the the politic, uh, his financial, uh, economic policy was based on uh, um, on uh, also social um, reforms to um, um, also I mean to um, public uh, to 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 towards the, the public services for, in terms of education, for instance, of health, and, uh, and also provision of electricity. Uh, so what he did uh, in that case was to build 11 new hydroelectric um, plants, which is good on economic terms, uh, but is really terrible for, I mean, from an environmental point of view and also territorial point of view, because it was extracting uh, 
water and uh, a, a, a di diverting uh, um, the streams and then a changing completely the ecological situation and causing a lot of problems. So, but anyway, it was, uh, how to say, nationally justified because uh, the rain, uh, so the, it, it was creating revenues that could be reinvested in these uh, social uh, uh, goals. So what happened uh, uh, is that also, from the indigenous point of view, it wasn't that in, that uh, that good because uh, uh, I mean, in the in the research for excellency in education, for instance, they cut uh, thousands of uh, community schools, and uh, the idea was a very old one of a pool of pools of excellency. So to cut uh, all the disseminated uh, units, scholar units, but uh, to have, uh, you know, uh, big, big uh, unidades. So, and that's why it was very important for people. So this caused uh, uh, rural urban migration and uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, problems because uh, all these would have needed uh, a, a network of transport that wasn't really accomplished. So. Transport was also very, very crucial, and uh, and also uh, these uh, these protests came up when uh, it was decided uh, within this uh, uh, reform to cut the subsidies to uh, to gasoline, which would have uh, increased uh, dramatically the um, uh, the prices of the tickets, for instance, for the public transport and gasoline for which is so important for for the transportation in the country. So that's why there also uh, uh, they started by saying uh, that uh, this was the main. Uh, I mean, it's it's been the the most uh, popularized uh, how to say um, message uh, for for the reform. But the reform, if I can go just very very quickly, uh, was. Uh, uh, um, was uh, agreed together with the uh, um, uh, International Monetary Fund, and uh, it was uh, um, it, it was uh, how to say um, involving several cuts to the public sector by, for instance, uh, thousand twenty three thousand civil servants dismissals, cuts of salaries, cuts of even the half of the holidays. Uh, uh, days uh, request of days pro bono with no salary uh, and uh, n no taxation increase so it's really neoliberal and uh, cuts to the gasoline subsidies for 1.3 million but 4.5 million of pardoning uh, to banks and this was not agreeable for uh, for the people so that's why uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the organizations organized this uh, march, this block of the streets, and uh, uh, until uh, you know, walking on a march and uh, arriving to, to Quito, then they occupied the streets. Uh, I mean, the, the, the main highways and also the streets of the of the city. So uh, at the beginning, uh, the, uh, the, the the parties involved were Conaye. The uh, Frente Unitario de los Trabajadores, Frente Popular, uh, at the beginning also the Federation of Cooperatives for Public Transport, but then uh, they um, they withdrew uh, with you and uh, uh, and also the students uh, of, of the main universities in Quito. Right. Okay. So well, in Colombia, well, in contrast, we have a bunch of grievances. Uh, well, basically, in the terms of the socioeconomic model, I mean, it's pretty similar than the Chilean one. Probably Colombia is one of the closest in that sense. But then again, we have to add uh, the, the, the political and armed conflict that uh, adds an additional layer of inequalities because this conflict has been like a uh, reproducing these inequalities and these uh, 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 like uh, uh, problems. But uh, I'm going to, uh, to the take the license to read a short summary because then again this is a bunch of grievances and I want to prefer to, to read it. So in principle, this Colombian national strike, I mean the, the current uh, protests are anti-government. Because, well, uh, the current government led by Ivan Duque that actually he was handpicked by this former Colombian president for two terms, Alvaro Uribe, 
uh, I mean, this uh, guy is uh, a guy that he has already involved with crime. I mean, this former president has already his hands with blood, but it still has some popularity in powerful st stakeholders, even intertwined with crime. So, but uh, it was very smart to handpick a guy that sold as a, a center or moderate uh, president, but uh, it has been the contrary. I mean, this president has been mm, very unpopular, and even people that supporting him uh, start to like uh, to be uh, against the, the president because he has been very very unpopular, and also because there is this uh, using the uh, Anna Harent concept of the banality of evil that he has been sold as a uh, good guy, but behind the scenes is deploying uh, a, a extreme far right policy and repression of his government. Uh, and in the top, the army and the police forces. But since he took in August 2018, different demonstrations has been happening throughout the country, from teachers and student movements to indigenous and peace and movements that they have been historically mobilizing. I mean, they, they, they have been the ones, and especially from the rural areas, not probably in the cities. Uh, but then again, this current government has been instead uh, increasing the perpetuation and pronunciation of unequal new extractive socioeconomic regime that is probably one of the similarities with other South American countries, countries through rampant and over corruption, which reduce precarization of life, the diminishing of the land, water, and life in all forms, and have brought a lot of grievances, injustice, and even uh, a lot of human rights violations that they are still tending to be uh, a result in justice. The national economy has substantially worsened in the, in worsened in the last three years, and the government has been drafting and enforcing policies against social care and labor principles. Uh, and even a harmful uh, new staff reform that was one of the uh, drivers of many of the recent protests, it was released just in the Christmas Eve when nobody was paying attention uh, behind the people and it was imposed in the parliament. So uh, still the, the government is not listening. And there are other grievances that if you wouldn't need enough reasons to go to the streets, uh, there are other additional reasons to understand the process. So there is a key point, as I said in the very beginning, that we have this uh, peace accord, the Havana Accords, between the Colombian state and the former FARC guerrilla, that they set up not only a conflict between these former guerrillas, but to talk about all the stakeholders of the Colombian anti conflict, that it has involved also people from private sector, I mean, people in the legal sector. They have, been, they have been, for instance, using paramilitary uh, groups or paramilitary death squads to dispossess people, uh, using also army and state forces in the past. Also, uh, right now, also has been taking this policy recently. So there is a demand in the full implementation of this process because it has been very uh, slow and uh, with a lot of uh, drawbacks. Uh, so, and also a contest act, uh, uh, like uh, attacks constantly to this special Europe Court justice, the, the head, the Justicia Especial para la Paz, that was set up after the peace agreement to uh, bring some peace uh, and reconciliation and justice in, uh, on the Colombian other conflict. Uh, but uh, still, on the, the current government, and this is a very serious thing, uh, still the police and army institution have. Uh, really, really strong influence in Colombian politics. It seems that this is like a parallel government uh, doing their own business. And nowadays, there is a reconfiguration of the geography of the world in Colombian conflict. After the former, I mean, some of the spaces that they were occupied by the former FARC guerrilla, now they are empty, and there is a total reconfiguration of the, uh, and the persistence of paramilitary groups and drug violence especially. There are some proofs that the Sinaloa cartel is influencing uh, in, 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 in drug production nowadays in Colombia, that the, the business has changed. So this like a drug violence has also affecting people living in the countryside. Uh, there is a return in the current government of a state terror policy. We remind the times of this, then again, the former president Alvaro Uribe, he was already persecuting political, uh, 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 like oppositors, human rights advocates, environmental activists. And just this weekend, he was released a report in, in the local press that the army, the, the current army, it was intercepting communications in the in, in the national courts, and Uribe has his former president uh, a, 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 a court case open for the first time. 
So there is a, a, a lot of fear of these people that are ruling right now the country. And there is a retaking a very bad policy, and I'm going to take, sorry, there is an image that I want to show you. Uh, this was some, uh, can you, anybody see this? Yeah. That this was a painted wall in Bogota that was erased for the army. And these are like a general, people from the uh, army uh, board, that they were involved in a legal established policy to kill innocent people and dress up as a guerrilla members between 2002 and 2010 in the, in the, in the government of Alvaro Uribe. And there is around 5,700 uh, innocent people killed. And these cases are, are just right now like uh, arising in the public opinion because of the peace agreement, then again. And, but most of these cases are uh, in film. Thank you so much for, sorry for Thank you, no, 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 Just for finish, <laughs> um, I, I will take one minute, sorry. It's like, a, there are also party members that have been assassinated, like a, in the last year, 150 members. Uh, the Colombian army also killed eight kids last year, uh, recruited kids, in, in, in that there were four recruits about uh, dissidents of the FARC. Uh, there is an uh, ongoing indigenous genocide. Uh, around 200 indigenous people have been killed since the 2016. A systemic annihilation of environmental activists in Colombia as well, that they are the keepers of the biodiversity in, and, and lands and water. And all these things are happening and the current Colombian government is more interested in what is happening in Venezuela than is happening in the country. So in general, it can be said that all the current and accumulated social environmental audiences gathered to spark the protest. Most of the Colombians are just fed up, and there is a similar, and I close here, uh, that in Chile, that the, the, most of the protests right now are led by environmental activists, youth activists, the feminist movement, LGBT community movement, and. I mean, especially the young generations. Of course, there are some people from the left that they are supporting, but they are not uh, a proper leader of the protest. It has been like a very uh, citizenship movement. So it's Thank you, Herman, Thank you. for your uh, in-depth description. Uh, Laura, I'm sorry, I would ask you to, to uh, keep the, the, the talk brief, so. please. So <laughs> we, we will have time for some more questions. So please, yeah. Laura. As, as you can see, to describe the, the situations of four different countries in this brief time is, is not an easy task, mm -hmm. but I, I'm going to try to be brief. So basically, I would say, in simplified terms, the three main reasons for people um, going to the streets and staying in the streets has been, um, well, first, the anti-democratic tendencies of the Morales government. Uh, he's overthrowing the uh, the referendum of uh, abolishing term limits for the presidency was one one thing that was already making people worried before the elections in in uh, October. Uh, second uh, reason was the assumed electoral fraud that happened in the October elections. Um, the organization of states of America uh, was um, overseeing the elections and they in their report in their audit of the elections they showed that there, they, there was fraud um, and also some independent researchers from Bolivia uh, claimed that there was fraud uh, in the elections, or at least there was irregularities. Um, the bias of, of, for example, the Organization of States of, of America um, has been questioned, but um, still the belief of, of many people has been that fraud happened it, to some extent, and that the election could not be validated. Um, so, Morales also accepted uh, that the elections should be, um, that they should be renewed. Um, and on the same day that he called for new elections in, in November, um, there was a call from the military for him to resign. And he resigned. 
so this has raised the, the third question that has uh, kept people in the streets is that was there a coup in Bolivia or was there not? So there has been demonstrations and demonstrators from both sides saying that there was a coup d'etat and then others saying that there wasn't. And um, yeah, in, among the Bolivian people, there's no um, there's no consensus if if there was a coup or not. Uh, in the international media, uh, there has been strong, I think, a, a strong uh, opinion of, of it being a coup. But uh, basically, what worries people now is how how the situation is gonna go from from here on. Uh, after Morales resigned, now there is an interim government um, controlling the country um, who have now called for new elections in May this year. And it is still quite unclear who is going to hold the power uh, between the end of January when the new president was supposed to take power until the new elections. And the inter interim government has been Mm, they have been involved in, in uh, they've been doing politics in a way that they they maybe weren't supposed to in this in this time when they were just supposed to call new elections and kind of hold the status status quo uh, but they've been meddling a lot for example in, in foreign policy and foreign foreign ties with with other countries and they've also um, uh, during during the interim government, uh, the protests grew a lot, and there were there have been more than thirty people dead, uh, eight hundred people wounded, a uh, thousand five hundred people uh, detained, and um, the interim government also issued a decree accepting armed forces personnel from persecution for the use of force, which which is a big human rights issue for for all the Bolivians, and uh, this has been a, a worrying. Uh, the question about actors uh, on the streets um, is a very complicated question, but in short, a lot of young people have been leading the protests. Uh, there have been people both from the left and the right. Uh, popular sectors have been presented, represented. There have been indigenous groups and leaders um, on kind of both sides, on Morales' side and um, in the opposition side, and there have been coca producers, peasant leaders, mining workers, health and education workers uh, that have been taken to the streets. Um, so it's it's quite diverse protests, um, although they've been dubbed as very middle class, um, right wing protests, but that's not the whole truth, at least. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we could then move to, to discuss a little bit uh, reactions of the government. Laura, you already mentioned about the presence of, of the violence in, in the protests. And as the protests began in different countries, on one hand, um, many of the respective governments, like that of Chile, announced a state of emergency or even of war, um, accused the protesters for vandalism and militarized the streets. Uh, but on the other hand, many human rights organizations and, and advocates uh, have announced widespread human rights uh, violations from the part of the government actors towards the demonstrators. So what kind of thoughts you have on these claims from, from the both sides? Uh, how the respective governments have, have handled or, or responded to the situation? Uh, well, I think that in Chile, the Chilean right wing and central right wing government has reacted really badly. I was in Chile in the mid of October, in the end of October, when, when the uh, military emergency uh, state was announced 
and um, the violence that uh, the, the, the military forces started and police forces started were absolutely very extreme in Chile in those times. I have been traveling and living there 30 years, as I told before, and I've never seen in these years something like that, that I something like that I saw in October in Chile, not even in the first weeks after the Pinochet regime was cancelled and finished in the beginning of the 90s. Now the, the United Nation sent, Nations sent uh, its delegation of human rights observers to, to Chile in those weeks and um, uh, when it, uh, we have now we now know the report of the United Nations uh, on the basis of uh, this journey of about 30 days in Chile, they have accused the Chilean police and armed forces of committing serious human rights violations in their response to recent mass demonstrations. Uh, they say that uh, they have verified four cases of unlawful deaths involving involving state agents. Uh, uh, they have noted uh, 345 people have suffered eye trauma from pellets. And this is the most serious eye trauma um, uh, disaster in Chile in the last decades. Uh, with torture and sexual violence also highlighted, I have personally met young people that I have been violated by police forces. Uh, during the, the detentions. Some 1,600 1, people remain in pre-trial detention out of 28,000 detained since mid-October. So uh, this was the, uh, uh, the most deep mistake uh, made by the, by, the, by, the, by the government because uh, because um, uh, the, I would say that the very fragile and complicated relationship with the, with the civil society and military forces and police forces in Chile have been now constructed and tried to be constructed in 30 years and it has been like a very fragile jar of pot and now it has been broken again. So uh, this was the most most uh, visual mistake, but uh, also the government. I noticed that the president uh, Sebastian Piñera was in the first place totally lost in this situation. He didn't understand at all what is happening because he doesn't know personally, and his government, many of his government persons, he don't know, they don't know personally the the uh, the situation of the people. Uh, I would say the most people of the country, how they live and what kind of needs they have. Uh, the, it, they, 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 the elites and the and um, uh, low-income uh, income people, they are totally uh, divided and separated in a social and political structures. Uh, but they, anyway, the government announced a 19 points um, agenda to make reforms. The first reform uh, is going to be uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the the amount of the money that retired persons get every month. Uh, they got before this, they got 140 euros, now they got 170 euros per month. And uh, the, maybe the most important anyway is uh, about the new, uh, uh, I would say the new um, uh, new uh, instruments to uh, to try to trying to resolve the situation in, in even in some way is um, announcement of a national plebiscite that is salute, salute to be held on 26th of April this year it's the planned referendum that will ask Chileans if they want a new political constitution. As I, as I told, the constitution was uh, established in 1980, and it continues the violent spirit of the uh, military regime now during the democracy. Uh, uh, they, uh, this, uh, now the, the, uh, the referendum will ask Chileans if they want a new constitution, and if they want it to be drafted by, the, by a constitutional convention, 
made up my members elected directly for this convention or by a mixed constitutional convention made up in halves by currently sitting members of parliament and directly elected citizens. A second vote on 26th October this, this year along, alongside with municipal and regional elections would elect the members of the constitutional convention. So this process is very slow. And a third vote would accept or reject the new constitution after it is drafted. It, it, this, this is expected to occur, occur in March 2022. So maybe or two or three or four years, Chile would have a new constitution, maybe. It's, if, 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 if nothing happens before that, the mass protesters, protest, protests will absolutely continue. They will not end. Um, uh, I, I want to mention that when we talked before about the different actors in this, this uh, social uh, movement, we have to, um, uh, we have to uh, see that there are some of uh, these, um, these radical looters uh, uh, which, which are attacking, uh, attacking the banks and they are attack, attacking the uh, supermarkets and uh, boutiques and they are destroying massively infrastructure. And the government uh, has been saying that they are lumpen. In Finnish, the word would be lumpuproletariati. The word comes from Karl Marx's term lumpenproletariat, which, um, which indicates uh, uh, the lowest, uh, uh, lowest, uh, uh, lowest people of the working class. So when government says they are lumpen, they, in the very Foucaultian spirit, they are trying to use power on them and say that they are bad, they are negative, they are only lumpen, when in the back they are normal, poor Chilean young people. And then in the other side, there is a very huge, big, 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 uh, peaceful uh, social demonstration process. And those people are very peaceful, artists, uh, uh, all the actors from the civil so society sectors, and uh, this uh, demonstration is very festive. Es una fiesta. So we have to uh, we have to see that there are different parts of this. Um, this um, sorry to be so long. And now to talk so long, I will uh, be more briefly now. And uh, but uh, regarding the reaction, I would say that uh, government has been has reacted blindly, uh, very um, slowly not maybe correctly, but at least they are doing something. And uh, what is the pity that when the, all the parties in political parties created a kind of a pact alliance to, to talk about the new referendum and how they will do it, um, I think it's a pity. You might have another opinion, but I think it's a pity that Communist Party and Partido Humanista Verde, Humanist Green Party, they stayed out of that. I understand it very well because they don't agree with the other parties. But anyway, it might be we could analyze if it would have been better to be inside the pact and try to discuss there than be outside. Because anyway, this uh, several parties pact will uh, alliance, sorry, alliance table guide now the process of the uh, all the response and solutions to this, uh, this, uh, this crisis. This, uh, um, uh, this uh, agreement of the party is uh, created uh, uh, on December. Sorry, oh, no. I, it was, I, I, I talked too much, but sorry. I Thank just wanted you, but to that say was this. very no, interesting. And to the Jennifer. <laughs> okay. Jennifer, would you have uh, anything to, to add to, <laughs> to Aulis? Aulis uh, well, I agree with, with your point of view only. Uh, the government has taken very, um, very badly, very bad like attitude, in very scared attitude at the beginning, declaring war, trying to uh, solve very arrogant, very out of the reality. There was filter of audio of the wife of the president saying that, what is this? This is an alien invasion? And that was like published like, in all the media. It, it was really um, 
really unbelievable to see to see how how they they handle or you should also say that sorry my friends that now we have to leave some of our privileges yeah, we have to accept aliens. this that was the mm -hmm. words of the Biden, Biden yeah. of the president mm -hmm. uh, after the all the informs of human rights violations violations well the government took also again very strong rejection toward them saying that they weren't uh, truth pretty much from amnesty from human rights watch uh, they just say that this is not valid uh, they also take part and support uh, the behavior of carabineros of the uh, uniform police and, and military police uh, nowadays in, in chile um it's, it's very it's very hard to explain like all the the, the points that, that, that this has, has been uh, have been unfolding and developed but, but maybe it's, it's something that, that I could say that now the indigenous community are saying, well, now you know, as Chileans, as normal citizens, how it feels to be Mapuche. Mapuche communities are constantly being uh, arrested and, and damaged and, and persecuted by, from police, of police. And this is something that is not of course, it's, it's hiding by, by, by the normal the mass media in Chile. Um, so, so yeah, it has, it has been like a, a very, very bad, bad uh, hunter from the government that creates more resistance, that creates more uh, different, uh, different particular, uh, as you say, like artists, the feminist movement, the different uh, actors from looking for the social rights to, to show up with more strength, to to create like a, a big, bigger uh, resistance movement that is still holding on in Chile. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> yes, uh, same for Ecuador. The media had a really an important role in uh, disseminating uh, fake news and disseminating especially an idea of uh, something terrible that was happening in the streets and for which the, the people from Quito, for instance, didn't want to go out. So uh, the majority of the, for instance, schools were closed and, uh, and also other offices, because uh, it looked like really there was a, the rebellion that was destroyed the city and, uh, and these things. So these to motivate also then uh, the cure few, the state of exception, and all, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the power given to the, to the military forces uh, to, uh, to arrest the people and to, to stop them violently. And this uh, violence has been perpetrated especially against the indigenous people. And, uh, and they caused also um, eight deaths, uh, one of which uh, was, uh, was, I mean, uh, uh, was quite an important element within the, the indigenous protest because he was a, a leader uh, from Cotopaxi. Uh, Innocencio Tukumbi. And, and then uh, there were uh, more than 1,300 people arrested and so on. So once they uh, declared the cure few, uh, there was a reaction in the city that was opposite from the, from the people. So they were all outside in the night banging uh, with the casserolasso, banging the pans and pots and, uh, and showing that they were they were in the street uh, and uh, claiming the right to be in the street. Um, uh, anyway, during this period, uh, so the, also the parliament was closed and uh, the, the president left, he flew from Quito, he went to Guayaquil. He didn't want to, uh, uh, to meet the, the uh, I mean, to retract the paquetazo and to meet the, the leaders of the protest. But then uh, this happened two weeks later and uh, he retracted it. So that was the response at the end. Uh, within these two weeks, uh, there were also a lot of things that happened that were, uh, that are, so there is no 